have any, um, do we have an announcement from Erin Forge from Grand Hills High School? We do. Oh, there she is. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Nelson, and attendees. The past month has been one of Granite's busiest in the past year that we have been doing distance learning. With increasingly better county conditions, we have resumed practice for cross country, track and field, tennis, softball, soccer, baseball, and football. We are incredibly excited for student athletes to be back in their element and cannot wait to see what their seasons hold. While conditions are becoming better, we will be state testing virtually this year, which means all of our teachers are hard at work to prepare us. Our students are showing great promise and we are sure that their results will be just as impressive as those of past years. We begin testing on March 15th. In order to keep spirits up and promote school pride, we will also be having a spirit week starting on March 15th. The days will range from wearing green for St. Patrick's Day to dressing up like your favorite book or TV character. We cannot wait to see what everyone comes up with and how high the participation will be. Speaking of participation though, we recently hosted a fundraiser at Chipotle for the class of 2022 and had a high level of attendance. The money raised will help our juniors with next year's events as they were not able to do their normal fundraisers this year. We are so proud of them for succeeding even when times are rough. Thank you all for your time this evening and until next time, always remember Maroon and Gray lead the way. Thank you so much, Erin, Maroon and Gray. Mm -hmm. Apple Valley High School, Mazel Sia. Good afternoon, esteemed board members. As we slowly transition back to in-person learning, we continue to work hard and keep busy. This Friday at 7 p.m., ASB is hosting its first ever virtual talent show. We have nine contestants and the show is sure to bring a smile to your face. ASB also hosted a successful SOP drive for geriatric patients. Yearbook collected senior superlative nominations and senior quotes. Yesterday, we had our high school awareness night for incoming freshmen. Ms. Howell continues to hold weekly trivia that many students look forward to. Most of our students who competed in SkillsUSA are advancing to state and many placed in top three in their competition. Many of our host students have started competing in their SLC events. Cross Country had their first meet last week against Serrano with one of our students placing fourth. Many of our sports are starting back up with practices. Our Sensations and Vocal Motion Choirs held a virtual Valentine's recital. Our graduation committee had a meeting and continued to brainstorm ideas to give seniors a great graduation. Next week, our cohorts will begin to come back on campus. As you can see, we are hard at work to keep up our activities and are making exciting progress moving forward. Thank you. And remember, Sun Devil Pride is contagious. Thank you, Sun Devil Pride is contagious, of, of course. Um, Union Representative, Callie, do we have any uh, information from CSEA? Um, we did not receive a report from CSEA. How about AVUTA? I did receive a report from AVUTA. Thank you. Good evening, board members and AVUSD administration. I'm sorry it has been so long since I have made a report. Unfortunately, I contracted COVID and it took me down for quite a while. If you have been watching the news, unions and districts are fighting each other throughout California about the reopening of schools. I am proud to say that is not the case with Abuda and AVUSD. We both have always had one common goal, to get our kids back into the physical classroom. When we were concerned about our safety, AVUSD didn't hesitate to give the members what they needed to feel safe. When the COVID numbers went up, the hospital was overwhelmed, AVUSD decided to close temporarily for all of our safety. Then the vaccines began being offered. We know without a doubt that Mrs. Nelson made that her own goal to get all of AVUSD employees the vaccine if they wanted it. I recently got the vaccine experience and you could see AVUSD's admin had a hand in every aspect of that effort. It was such a smooth event. 
Mrs. Nelson and AVUSD admin, you have our sincerest thanks for getting this done and the teachers from other districts who have been vaccinated through the St. Aries Clinic. Now we await Monday, March 8th, where we once again get to see our preschool through sixth grade students in person, and we are excited. High school will start cohorts soon, and they will get to see some of their students too. The high school members hope to see the numbers continue to go down and have hopes of reopening again as well. Thank you for all your support, and we hope to see you on the campuses as we open up next week. Dr. Christy Croft, Abuda President. Thank you. The clerk will read out any action taken in closed session. Okay. So the first uh, readout is on um, item B1, public employee discipline dismissal release. And on a motion uh, made by Wilson So and seconded by Lassen Game. Uh, <clears throat> okay. The motion passed uh, 5-0. Moving on to B-5, which was conference with uh, lab labor negotiator on a motion by So and a second by Okapara. It was a 5-0 approval. 5-0 approval. 5-0 approval. 5-0. I like to hear my voice. How are five oh? Is it the uh, streaming? You're still going. I'm I'm still here. We're good. Okay. On uh, B five conference with lab labor negotiator uh, on a motion by Okpara and a second by Blasting Game. Uh, the motion passed uh, unanimously five zero, which was approval of United. Teachers Association of Uda Memorandum of Understanding. So with that, that's all we have to report from closed session, uh, Madam Chair. Good. The board may approve the agenda as is. We, um, uh, into the microphone. Uh, everything's streaming well. I can hear the stream well. Um, the readouts, my only question is, I, I heard the motion, I heard the second, I heard the vote, but did we... Read, read in the record the content of each read readout. Read the full record. The, the okay, full no, record. I did not. I so let's let's. I'll read the content. Let's start with uh, B one, which was on a motion uh, five zero. It was to release classified employee number five eight eight four effective March fourth two thousand twenty one, pursuant to the notice of intent to discipline by dismissal dated February second, twenty twenty one. And on B five. It was approved the Apple Valley Unified Teachers Association of Vuda Memorandum of Understanding regarding the revision to the January 20th, 21 Memorandum Understanding PARS Supplementary Retirement for the 2021 school year dated February 25th, 2021. And again on B5, it was approved 5-0 that the Apple Valley Unified Teachers Association of Vuda Memorandum of Understanding regarding supplemental par supplemental retirement plan for the 2020 school year dated january 20th 2021 so those are the three the three items Thank okay you. the board may approve the agenda as is or add and or pull items from the consent agenda for discussion and or action we need to adopt the agenda as is. I need a, a motion. Can we adopt it as is? Um, who's seconding? I'll second it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Public comments. Oh no, we have discussion. We have a discussion item, right? You do, you have a presentation by- um, Yeah, it was not highlighted. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Schoenberg has a little discussion. Okay. You have two actors. Yeah. We have a presentation on second interim 2020 2021 by Matthew Schoenberg. Thank you. 
Uh, for the board's information, um, you'll see there is an accompanying item on the consent agenda for the board to approve uh, the 2020-21 second, in second interim report to send down to the county. <clears throat> As I've uh, kind of covered in my interim reports, just to refresh everybody's memory, this report does certify the district's financial condition for the current year and two subsequent years based on the projections. Uh, there are two required interim reporting periods each fiscal year, this being the second. So this illustrates our financials as of January 31st, and the report is due down to the county by March 15th. Again, we do have a multi-year projection as a part of this. It does reflect several budget adjust adjustments that have been posted subsequent to first interim, uh, both on the revenue and the expenditure side of the budget, and of course, updated assumptions based on current information available which at this point seems to change hourly as we're working through our current pandemic and uh, federal and state funds towards resuming in-person instruction. Uh, there are three certifications possible, the positive, qualified, and negative. Uh, positive being the one you want as you predict or you project you will meet all your fiscal obligations for the particular reporting period. We will be filing a positive certification. And of course that we also, that just lists some of the information we use in producing this interim report, um, state adopted budget, our current board approved operating budget, the governor's recent January budget proposal, uh, school services and FICMAT information for LCFF. And of course, uh, newsletter from the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools, which gives guidance to school districts throughout the straight state <clears throat> based on uh, second interim assumptions. So just a couple of highlights. If you take a look, this is our funded ADA, and you'll see how it's kind of evolved from budget adoption through first interim to second interim. Uh, we we fine-tune it as we move through the year. We did have some adjustments from first to second um, based on some adjustments we, wait, we made to our ADA. But you'll see for second interim, we are budgeting our projected ADA at 12606. That's based on the ADA hold harmless that's currently in place. <clears throat> For next year, we are projected at 12606 because as we get into next year, it will have the prior year guarantee and we are currently assuming a decline of ADA for next year. So we're budgeting at this year's funded ADA under that prior year guarantee. In 22-23, we're returning to our projections of a slight increase. So what we're projecting at this point in terms of our enrollment in ADA is that we're gonna recapture the majority of the students that we've lost during the pandemic and continue our small, moderate growth each year. Now, that of course may change as we move forward into creating the budget for next year and update our multi-year projections. Our COLA assumptions, you'll see they kind of, they really evolved from budget adoption through first interim to where we are today. Uh, the budget adoption, of course, being <clears throat> a 2.31% COLA in the current year with a 10% reduction. Um, at the first interim, it was 0% because that was uh, what we got with cash deferrals rather than that reduction in LCFF funding. So we are currently at second interim again with that 0% COLA in the current year with significant cash deferrals of our apportionment, which did start uh, this last month. Next year, uh, we are looking at a 3.84% COLA. That is what the governor proposed in his January budget. Uh, compounded COLA, it's paying, paying us back for the COLA that was missed this year. And then the COLA, the statutory COLA calculated at 1.5% for next year, add those two together and compound them. And then for 22-23, we are aligning ourselves with the school services dartboard recommendation at a 1.28% COLA. So just a quick run through of our assumptions. Um, again, our funded ADA, our COLA, we do have those cash deferrals. I wanna point out, those are the COVID one-time monies that we've received in this year. We have our state learning loss mitigation fund, about 1.1 million. The federal coronavirus relief fund, 10.4. GEAR is the governor's emergency education relief fund and the federal ESSER monies. <clears throat> those are all one-time funds that flowed to us in the current year. So those are all one-time revenues that have been recognized 
as we move through our multi-year projection, uh, we're, we're not getting those revenues next year. So we have to remove those revenues in our multi-year projection. On the expenditure side, you'll see we also, we, we account for step and column every year. We account for the STRS and PERS employer contributions on behalf of all of our employees. And just a little quick note on that COVID spending, you'll see that state, uh, 1.1 million, those funds have to be spent by the end of this fiscal year, June 30th, 2021. And we're on the way to do that. The federal coronavirus relief funding, that 10.3 million, the original expiration date for those funds was December 30th of 2020. We did spend all those funds prior to that deadline, but that deadline has been expended, extended to May 31st, but we did expend those. The federal GEAR and federal ESSER funds, they don't expire until September 30th of 2022. We are uh, budgeting some expenditures in those funds, but we are also carrying some of those funds into the next year and plan on spending them next fiscal year. Next year's revenue assumptions, you'll see that we ADA, the COLA of 3.84% does net us an increase in our LCFF funding of about $5.6 million. That is both base grant money and supplemental and concentration grant funds. Uh, we are budgeting the federal ESSER II revenue. That is based on the relief package that President Trump signed just prior to the new year. Uh, we don't have a dollar amount yet, an uh, uh, exact dollar amount, and we, we believe some of it's going to flow to us this year, but we currently are budgeting it, budgeting it all in the 21-22 year. And again, on the expenditure side, step and column, of course, you'll see our STRS and PERS employer contribution rates that we're planning on. We also plan on a certain amount of certificated attrition. And we do have that PARS supplemental retirement program. We do not know the full uh, extent of, the, of that particular program as of now. We always adjust our expenditures. And of course, we do adjust for operating cost inflator of 1.5% currently in our multi-year projection. <clears throat> At first interim, you might recall, we had about $9 million of line item reductions in this particular year. Uh, we have removed those line item reductions out of our multi-year projection, and you're going to see the impact in our multi-year projection based on the increased COLA, uh, which offsets some of that, but also some of the one-time funding. Um, however, you'll see in our multi-year projections, we still do get very close to our minimum required reserve. So future expenditure reductions may still be required. In fact, most likely will be required in some quantity as we move through this particular budget cycle and move into the next budget cycle in our out years. So I uh, just wanted to make that, uh, just wanted to make that point as we look at our multi-year projection. In 22-23, you'll see our revenue again, our ADA, the COLA that school services is recommending, that nets us about a $2 million increase in our LCFF. That federal ESSER II money that I mentioned, we are budgeting to receive and expend in the 21-22 year. We, of course, have to remove that from our revenue side. And of course, we also remove the expenditures from the expense side in our multi-year projection. And again, our assumptions, there's the STRS and PERS employer contribution rates that are currently projected for that year. And again, our, our operating cost inflator and uh, the other assumptions we use on the expenditure side. So some quick numbers. Uh, this is the unrestricted side of our Fund 01 general fund. You'll see the revenues, expenditures, the sources, uses, that is a, the net effect of the transfers out, usually from unrestricted side to the restricted side of our budget to cover restricted program operating costs. So you'll see on the unrestricted side, we're currently projecting a deficit of about $9.6 million in the current year. Uh, that deficit, <clears throat> that projected deficit will change now as we move towards estimated actuals where we get a better understanding of what budget versus actual is going to be spent over the next several months. But you'll see that does have a significant impact on our unrestricted ending fund balance based on what we know as of our January 31st financials. 21-22, you'll see the projection that the 144.9 million revenue, that's uh, the increase in that is solely tied to the 3.84% COLA on the LCFF. 
And you'll see from 21-22 to 22-23, the increase in revenue to 146.9, again, is the increase in our LCFF revenue. But you'll see with our current assumptions at the end of the 22-23 school year, we are projecting an ending fund balance of just over $6 million at this point on the unrestricted side of our budget. And again, I would like to point out this multi-year projection is built now without the $9 million of reductions we had built in at first interim in our multi-year projection. The restricted side of the budget, <clears throat> you'll see the revenues and expenditures. Again, the revenue in the current year and next year includes significant one-time federal and state COVID relief funds. That's why you see the, the disparity between the current year at 39.7 to the third year out at 21.2, because we're not expecting to receive any more COVID relief funds in the third year of this particular cycle. You'll see a restricted ending fund balance in the current year of about four and a half million dollars. That is due to not spending all of the one-time money in this fiscal year, but carrying some of that revenue over to the 21-22 year. And you'll see we are planning on spending currently in our assumptions because that money does all expire in September of 22. So we're planning on expensing it in the 21-22 school year. And this is merely the slide that combines both the unrestricted and the restricted. In the components of the ending fund balance, the most important numbers are down at the bottom. What, are, what is our 3% required reserve for state law? And what is our 5% required per board policy? You'll see in the current year, our combined ending fund balance is $13.1 million. So we do meet both the three and the 5% board policy reserve. When we get into 22 and 23, we still meet our 3% required reserve due to state law, but we are no longer meeting our 5% required reserve per board policy. So as we work on our upcoming budget cycle, that is something where we will have to pay special attention to, to ensure that we do have a plan in place to meet our 5% board policy required reserve. And just some highlights. We are currently approximately 549 students lower than we were in March 2020 across our system. Of course, the uh, ADA Hold Harmless has helped us this year, as it has many districts across the state. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, in 22-23, we are still projecting a slight increase in our ADA, so we are currently counting on getting the majority of those students back into our system when we return to in-person instruction in a hopefully normal operating scenario for Apple Valley Unified. Continued deficit spending is something we always need to be aware of. And of course, the May revise will come up. Well, Governor Newsom uh, will, uh, <clears throat> will uh, probably propose some more adjustments to the state budget, which will in fact um, affect our local operating budget. And of course, the long-term impacts of the pandemic on state revenues are still unknown. In the short term, of course, the state is doing quite well, uh, but we don't know what will happen in the long term. That's all I have. Any questions? The, I, I don't believe the, uh, the additional so-called illegal uh, migrants have, will impact Apple Valley des High Desert at all, right? Because I don't I do not see any impact. Uh, then, because if they come in, they will increase the the student, the no, losing students. I don't believe we'll experience any significant impact from from that. I have a question. Yes. Uh, if we spend all the money that is allocated for um, the COVID relief, yes. If we just spend it, yes. Uh, will we still have reserve to manage the COVID expectations that is put? put on us by the state and the federal government and the CDC. If we just use the money for what they have allocated, will we still be able to manage what we have? 
Well, if, if we did spend all of the federal money allocated to us, that certainly would have an impact on our projected ending fund balance because part of our ending fund balance is that restricted balance, the, re the restricted funds that have flowed to us in the current year that we're not planning on spending in the current year. Would we still be able to manage? Uh, yes, we would, but things would be very tight in the budget. Uh, we most likely would not be able to um, expand any services, and we would have to be very deliberate in any purchasing decisions that we make. Okay. My next question is on the uh, assumptions. You had the 2021 um, and 2021-22 and 22-23 assumptions, mm -hmm. and I'm paying close attention to the expenditures uh, where you said that the stirs and PERS in 2021, the SPERS, the, the SPERS was 16.15 and the PERS was 20.70. But in 21-22, it appears the PERS went up, the STIRS came down. And then in 22-23, the STIRS went up and the PERS also went up. That's correct. How is that affecting us uh, as a district, because now that's about how much you put in, right, as a district. Yes, that is the employer mm -hmm. contribution on behalf of our employees. Um, and over time, you've seen significant increases in the STIRS and PERS employer contributions. Um, if I remind the board and, and any of those watching, the current year and next year's STIRS contributions, um, the governor... Uh, the, the governor pledged some monies over the last couple years to buy down that rate increase. Mm -hmm. That's why we're seeing a slight reduction uh, yes. in the in, current in year the current and year. next year's PERS, I'm sorry, STRS mm -hmm. employer contributions. Um, in the 22-23 year, that buy down goes away, hence the increase of we'll 18 percent. And that's currently the projected STRS rate for 22-23. You'll see that little note. The CalSTRS board may adjust that based on their investment returns and, okay. and how the pool is performing, as PERS can also adjust those rates. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then, Mr. Sheehan. Okay. Uh, presentation on restart to in person instruction under elementary waiver, small stable cohorts, and approved athletic conditioning and competition by Mr. Schlosser. <laughs> Thank you. I'm uh, going to connect here to the, I'm trying to connect. I got it. Okay, looks like we're going to be able to do this. Thank you. Thankfully, and totally appropriately, um, Ms. Orge and Ms. Sia pre previewed what we're going to talk about right now, which is our restart. Students are returning to campuses for all kinds of activities, school and extracurriculars, and they talked about that. Wasn't it great to hear them talking about athletics yes, and those kinds of things again? And so, and as, as Dr. Croft mentioned, and kind of celebrated, we've hit some important milestones. One, our declining case rate, right? That's, that's critical. And um, our vaccination effort that was mentioned also, what an important part of this puzzle to get students back on campus. And so in coordination with employee associations, we are happy to report to you some important new steps in reopening. So the first one is athletics. So outdoor sports have been allowed once we reached a certain threshold of cases, which we did. Um, we are below 14, which was what the CIF placed as sort of a threshold for return to outdoor sports, including football. And so what's listed here are students are out um, preparing, conditioning, practicing, and in fact, competing in cross country. Tennis is coming up with uh, on their first competitions, golf, baseball and softball are getting started, but they don't have competitions yet, but they're coming up on those. And soccer will begin their uh, practices in earnest. And then football as well. Football players are out there in helmets and uh, they'll be moving forward towards practice in pads, full contact. And then their first week of games will be the week of February or sorry, March 15, with a game later that week. We don't know the exact date of the games yet. They're still working to sort out officials because they don't have as nearly as many officials for the football season as they usually do. It will be a six game season at the most, but it will be a, a great to have those athletes out on the fields. Um, indoor sports have also been uh, cleared to practice outside. And so you might see uh, basketball players returning to outdoor basketball practice 
and volleyball out there as well if they can sort out the right um, appropriate uh, facilities. So that is great news for athletes to be back. Um, and of course, in addition, and at the same time, really, starting on Monday, we are um, kind of pushing play again on our students who are in school in the fall. Those students in the preschool program will be returning. Our TK through sixth grade students, at the ones who were at school on the waiver in that two day per week model will be returning to that model in order to accomplish that small class size that we must accomplish for the waiver in the current tier we're in. Even if we go down to the red tier, our understanding is that this time we must maintain that smaller class size and the appropriate spacing that allows. And so, um, that, but that's a great next step. That day is slightly shorter in order to allow the teacher to then connect with those students who do not come to school that day in that online setting. Senate Bill 98 does still require daily live interaction. In addition, um, um, we'll go up to the next one. Uh, we will have special populations and cohorts returning. Special education students, English language learners, foster youth, students who have difficulty connecting, um, lots of different students returning, including some career and technical education students returning to um, small, stable cohorts of students on campus. Some two days a week. In some cases, they'll be there four days a week. This is a great first step. I'm gonna pause here and let Mr. Schulenberg talk a little bit about our restart of home to school transportation and our community meal service. Thank you, yeah, I'm, I'm proud to say, and uh, hopefully you've seen, we've had buses out around the town of Apple Valley this week, drivers getting back, getting the buses out, exercising the engines, getting them ready for the kids for Monday. So we will be transporting um, all of our special ed students that require transportation in their, in their IEP. Um, and also we will be transporting our TK through six waiver students to our elementary schools. Our routes are posted on our website for our families to take a look. We are requiring bus passes as that is a standard procedure in our transportation department. But I know our drivers are excited to get back on the road and getting our kids to school. Our community meal service has been very successful since the start of the pandemic, providing lots of meals to the families of Apple Valley. And that's something we will continue to do when we resume our, our uh, instruction, in-person instruction on Monday. However, we're gonna change it up a little bit. We are going to go back to a daily community service, community meal service model. Really, this is driven by the need for us to ensure that we're not serving duplicate meals to students. The state requires us to submit what's called a meal integrity plan. So they want to ensure we're serving appropriate meals to everybody that can get them, but not serving duplicate meals to kids. So we'll be serving meals to all of our students that are in person and serving to those community members still age two to 18 during those days at 11 of our school sites. And so that's, that's an ex exciting next step for us to start on Monday. Um, in the weeks that follow, um, we will be expanding the cohorts that are considered that those at-risk groups um, as defined by recently uh, signed legislation, SB and AB 86. That will include more career and technical education groups, seniors at risk of, of needing credits to graduate, students who need full-time guidance or someone to help them make those next steps. Um, principals have been pr uh, sending proposals in for groups that they can properly manage and bring under the same conditions that are required for that stable grouping. But they are, um, everyone wants to make this expand this as, as we can do so safely. Um, now, as we work out of this purple tier and into the red tier, then there are, is the consideration for returning seventh through 12th grade students into classrooms in some manner. And so we're um, in planning stages for that. We're working toward how that, what that might look like. Of course, that's a different kind of thing with a master schedule, depending, because we know based on our last um, survey of families that not all families plan to return their students to school full time. And so we need to continue to offer virtual option for all, anyone who wants it, but also be able to bring students back and comply with the social distancing or spacing rules that will be in place for us at that time. And that guidance continues to change. 
Uh, in fact, even today, uh, that guidance is changing. We are in a regulatory web that's a little bit tough to navigate, but we are being careful and working together with all groups and as we do this. And so it will probably be a hybrid schedule at first of some sort. Um, and we will be consulting with associations to make sure we do that appropriately. But as soon as we can do that, we'll be looking to bring students back in those grades levels as well, so that we can have students returning to our systems from preschool through the adult program. So this is a great next step. We made the commitment to only restart once more. We feel confident that the trajectory of the public health data suggests that that's where we're headed. We, we feel good about that. And um, we are um, looking forward to seeing the smiling faces of kids getting off these buses, even if they're smiling through a mask as we take their temperature. It's still <laughs> such a joy. Do the kids have to wear masks? They do. Yes. We still during, have a mask during requirement. During class and recess? Yes. They do. They're allowed, the last guidance we had is they could go outside and be spread out and have a mask break. There really isn't a lot, they're there kind of a short time, so there isn't a lot of recess time trying to make sure that they get time with their teachers while they're on campus during this, at least as a schedule as it's built now. So there's, they still have to wear masks on campus and on buses. And that is a state law. That is the guidance and the mandate uh, requirement and including our waiver as it's written. I mean, it's not. It's not our, it really isn't our choice. Right, <laughs> yeah. The question that I have, um, because you're going to be doing that split scheduling where you have some parents who are saying, they don't really want their children back. Do, do we have enough staffing to, to manage that if that should be the issue? We do, but that is why the schedule becomes complicated. Okay. And we have, to make, um, we have to make some sacrifice in the length of time of, of in-person instruction in order to accomplish both. Okay. Yeah. But I, I appreciate the question because what we can't do is ask for more. We, have, we wanna make sure we can make this an accomplishable task. And the last thing I'll say is that we do know that with this new law, there is a requirement for some expanded learning, including summer school, both this summer and next and after school. And so we're um, in the process of picking dates and planning our summer school program for this summer. There is no reason under the current guidelines why we won't be able to accomplish a summer school, for example, for our extended school year students who are in a small cohort anyway, and it's demanded by their IEP for having, in, and we should be able to provide in-person instruction given what we know today. Given what we know today. Could change tomorrow. Could change tomorrow. Thank you, we're so excited for this. Other what, questions? What, uh, what tier would it be that uh, to get to um, where there is no choice for uh, other than in-person learning, where there is no options to do online versus uh, in-person learning? I don't know that that's a tier. And, it's not and really the other, tier, but it's, I guess, going to have to be just completely. If it, the, the way I'd answer that is this. Mr. Schumerberg made reference to the ADA we've lost over time. Our goal is to provide education for every member of our community. And so if that's the program that we think that folks want to have, we think if we can properly sort of build and, and, and plan and, and train staff, we can run a virtual program alongside our schools next year that are dedicated to that so that we're not trying to have, teachers aren't trying to do both things. So there's a possibility that even if schools and high schools go back in August, which would be the yeah. 2020, 21, 22, 21, year, 22, that they're still going to be doing the uh, virtual. virtual. There could be still a virtual school experience that we put together for students who still, or students and families who still feel like they want that. We may not be able to offer every single experience that way right there's it's harder to do yeah, welding <laughs> virtually yeah, but we we don't want to lose those students yeah. to programs that that say they can do that because we think we can do it better so, so um, my question is um, that do we have so, some where in um, time when the seventh through twelfth grades are going back we don't know yet when that might be because we do have to be in the red tier to have them go back in anything other than a small stable cohort. However, if that happens in the weeks to come or, or you know, we have a spring break coming, then it could be that they could go back if they wanted to in some kind of hybrid model. But again, we, we don't believe we will have the kind of flexibility that would allow them to return as a full class all day on campus 
Do you follow me? Uh -huh. And if that's okay. not the case, then we have to find a way to have them partially there, partially at home. These are great questions. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you very much. Great Kelly, job, do guys. we have any public comments? We do. We do. Okay. The first comment is from Melanie Edwards. To whom it may concern, my name is Melanie Edwards. My children are in kindergarten and second grade. My question is, what is our school district's plan on reopening schools immediately? I do not understand why we continue to put our children's education last. Our own governor has said that schools need to be open by mid-February and that, we may, that may, we may do so in the process of teachers getting vaccinated. Please allow the teachers that do want to get back to work to teach our kids in the classroom. We have done so in the past with safety precautions. Unfortunately, my children have only been in the classroom for a total of four days, and that is unacceptable. Our children are the ones who are suffering the consequences of this school closure. It has been a year of distance learning, and it is time to open our schools. There are many frustrated parents. Our district has left us and our kids in the dark during this whole closure. I can count on one hand how many times we have heard from our principal. We have friends in Orange County that get weekly emails from their principal and have been back in the classroom for two weeks now. Also, we have family in other states who have had their schools open since last August, even during times COVID cases were high. This has been poorly handled by our leadership and we deserve better. Please open our schools. The hospital numbers are down in our community. You know it's the right thing to do. Look at the science. Please contact me at any time. Thank you, sincerely, Melanie Edwards, and she provides a phone number. The next comment is from Jose Arredondo. To whom it may concern, I now have two kids that have not had the opportunity to have a senior year. While I understand that last year, we didn't know what we were dealing with in terms of this virus, we definitely do. Now we have a much better understanding of it. We now know what we can do to thwart the threat of this virus and the illness it causes. We know that it doesn't affect and infect children like it does adults. I understand that some teachers are unwilling to enter a classroom with children that could possibly be infected or have come from a possibly infected home. I know that many teachers, my wife being one of them, are willing to assume that essential worker role and get back to the business of shaping the minds of our young Americans. My question is, are these teachers that are unwilling to enter the classroom also unwilling to leave their homes and enter a store or a restaurant or any other place that could possibly be infected with an infectious individual. I hear many excuses as to why our kids can't have in-person learning and interaction with other humans their age. They all sound like excuses. I know that to a certain extent, we have had to abide by our county mandate, but in this case, they have to lift this lockdown. So we have, to, if they lift the lockdown, do we have a plan of action to reopen? I hope we do. I love Apple Valley High School. It is my alma mater. I honestly believe that it is the premier high school in high desert, but public schools remaining closed definitely gives school choice a new chance. In the words of other parents in the US, figure it out. Thanks for your time, Jose Arredondo. The next comment is from Jason Rayburn. My son has been an above grade, grade level student from kindergarten through sixth grade at Rio Vista. When schools closed due to COVID, so did many workplaces, allowing parents to be home with their children to help with schooling and make sure they were staying on task. I was able to work from home through mid-September 2020 <coughs> before returning to my job. This left my seventh grader home much of the day by himself, where he was suddenly tasked to become a 12 year old college student, as this was now his responsibility to log into Zoom and get his work done with no figure present to make sure things were getting done, just like he would do in school. 
first trimester ended pretty well with most of his grades at an A or B level. Second trimester, disaster. All Fs and one C. This is his doing as he missed a lot of Zooms and assignments, and I made him understand that he has no one to blame but himself. Or does he? Is it fair for a child to suddenly have to turn into an adult overnight to basically homeschool themselves as millions of people have gone back to work in California since COVID started and many have had to leave their child at home? And as for the Fs, only one of his teachers reached out to us to see if things were okay. This was the class he was able to get a C in. Where's the accountability of these teachers that failed to call, email, text, or use a mailbox? He was failed by these teachers and they deserve an F as well. So here's part of our story. The social aspect and lack, lack of athletics is another void in our son's life. I see private school in my child's near future as I am convinced full-time public schools are a thing of the past in California. And how, the and how is the infection rate in schools that are open? Low, very low, or they would not be open. Thank you for your time, Jason Rayburn. The next comment is from um, Mr. Zach Edwards. Um, this one he also attempted to send to um, Mrs. Nelson, but um, misspelled her name. Dear Board of Trustees and Superintendent Nelson, I've had a child in the school district for only three years now and a second who is just getting started. Almost a year has passed since school closures and the subsequent switch to distance learning. That being said, I'm embarrassed to admit that this is my first time participating in the board meeting, even though I've been highly critical of decisions made here in Apple Valley. I would be wrong if I didn't assume that some of the blame for the continued challenges our children face. My comment will be brief as I attempt to convey a constructive yet critical statement. I try to understand the challenges as a public school district faces as a, dire as a direction flowing from the top down. In this case, from the state to the county to the district. No matter if you agree with the direction of those at the top or not, overall survival is dependent on your ability to follow the best you can. I cannot fault our district and superintendent for following county and state mandates, no matter how much I disagree. My concerns are directed more so at my own misunderstandings. I don't understand how a population of educators who on one hand plead for the importance of their survival and the ability to thrive, yet on the other cower at the thought of having to teach in an environment where COVID-19 transmission is non-existent. I don't understand how representatives can ignore the fact that we are surrounded by states and schools opened to instruction and somehow think we as parents will passively follow such a blind and misguided approach to reopening. Is there a member of the board willing to stand up and speak out in recognition of our faults as a state, county, and district? Will the superintendent recognize the success of local schools and counties who are open to instruction? Your hands are tied, I understand, but your mouths have not been shut. Your voices have not been silenced. It's our right as parents in this district to know where our representatives stand. I'm asking each of you, as you open your eyes to the science and knowledge we've gained, as you look past our borders and at other examples of success, will you speak how you truly feel? That is all I ask. Thank you, Zachary Edwards. The next comment is from Danielle Baez. I am writing to give you a glimpse into one point of view. My child did not get to finish her kindergarten year. From March until the end of the school year, we were given one assignment a week. A week, unacceptable on every level. My child is extremely shy. She is quiet and she already deals with anxiety. She has now missed an entire year of very important social skills for her age group while the schools are getting a, ma a major payday by never making any, marking anyone absent. I can't help but wonder if virtual schooling is more beneficial momentarily for the district and this is why it continues because it's definitely not the science considering Dr. Fauci already said kids need to be back in school. Coming back to October last year, 
It took a lot of courage for my daughter to come back for two and a half days with her anxiety. And somehow, a few weeks later, the district decided it wasn't actually a good time to be in school. The anticipation of the holidays, we were told. These holidays do not change each year. So did you forget about them a few weeks earlier when you told our kids they could come back? My daughter was hysterical. Someone who had a tough time socially in school was hysterical because the amount of change she has had to deal with at six years old is heartbreaking. The one constant in every kid's life, despite home life and everything they deal with is school. Our schools here in Apple Valley have failed our children. We have six-year-old children sitting in front of a screen and they call it school. How is this what our school system has become? How is this the system our kids deserve while most every other state is continuing to pass our kids in education as they have been in person, full-time learning the entire school year? Our first graders have not been given one spelling test this entire year, but we still, but we still claim to be providing the same education. More than half of my friends and family have moved for more normal and better education at the private schools. I am certainly waiting for some spots myself for my children. I refuse to let my kids think this is normal or acceptable. How can a school a few miles away be providing a full-time in-person education without masks and we are still having small children sitting in front of computers debating on if we will allow them back for three hours twice a week with no recess or lunch? Does this sound acceptable to anyone here? Let's do what our children deserve and what science is showing us and get them back to school full time. Let's get our children, our, let's get their children, these childhoods back and give them the education they deserve that ourselves, we were able to have. Get the kids back in school four time, full time before you lose any more children. The next comment is from Lisa Blackwell. I am writing today to express my concern and frustration for high schools remaining closed. When will our high schools open up again? Why are the high school aged kids not being discussed? As a concerned parent, I want answers. We have to do better than this for our children and community. They deserve better. Thank you. The last public comment is from Krista Scharnberg. Hi, I have a junior that attends Apple Valley High School. I am really concerned with the well being of the junior high and high school aged kids. I have never had to do so many talks with my child over his grades in the last 10 years of his school years. Even the issues that have been happening with teachers not inputting grades, saying they did not receive this kid's work, or even teachers not reaching back out to the students when they are needing help. I feel if these kids were back in school, they would not be having these issues. It's so easy to just not respond to them. These kids need the direction from the teachers, not go on Zoom, get the schoolwork, and that's it. They need the social part of the teacher's appearance in person, learning, not to mention the attention. These kids are so lonely being at home with the computer and trying to focus after staring at the computer for hours on end. The lack of in-person learning is affecting their drive to succeed and complete their tasks, which in turn will affect them their whole lives. Some teachers make such an impact on children's lives and they need in-person learning. Also, as a parent of a high schooler, I have seen firsthand and I've talked to plenty of our friends that this stay at home learning has affected these kids dramatically. I'm talking kids that never get C's, D's and even F's. And now these grades, these are the grades they are now getting. As for the grade school kids, it has affected them too. But I do believe that the older kids are having a harder time than the younger kids. Everyone is so worried about the grade school kids. Well, grade schoolers cannot be left alone. Therefore, they have direction and supervision at all times with adults or someone that can help them with their schoolwork as a teacher would. Junior high and high school kids do not have that. They are home alone, trying to learn and leaning on each other to figure this stuff out. I cannot help with Common Core math or other classes as I never learned this new era of teaching and I work full time, as do a lot of the parents I know. And then there are sports. 
I have friends in Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas that have their kids in school full time and playing sports just as normal, and they have had absolutely no problems. I know our governor is a big issue, but so is the teachers union. Just let them go back to school. I know sports just got started back up and I have seen happiness in my son since then, but all it takes is one person to get upset and then you guys put a stop to it. This isn't a game, it's our children's life. If people don't want their kids to come to school or to play sports, then let them stay at home. But the kids that want to go to school and play sports, just let them attend and let them play. It's been going on way too long. It's time to try and get back to normal as much as we can. Thank you, Mrs. Scharnberg. Good job, Yes, thank you for reading. Thank you so much. Um, yes. Superintendent's comment. I um, appreciate all the parent comments um, regarding returning to school. And um, I also appreciate that um, it followed a presentation by Mr. Schillen, or Mr. Schlosser, um, who followed Mr. Schillenberg. Um, the presentation regarding resuming in-person instruction does answer some of the questions that were asked um, that are still guidance and requirements from our state. Um, that said, Several of the comments that were made, I would like to um, indicate will be referred back to school sites. I'd like um, information regarding some of the D's and F's. Um, I'll work with Mr. Schlosser's office to um, look into contacts and different things like that having to do with um, some of the um, lack of, of contact that is um, stated. So we'll follow through with that. Um, Today at one o'clock, we were notified that AB 86 is um, the bill that was um, containing the school reopening package was sent to Governor Newsom's um, office. Um, it is believed that he will sign it um, with the amendments that are in place. Um, that said, those amendments are, are different than what was drafted in December. Um, the set of guidance is located in multiple places, um, different than when we started the pandemic. When we started the pandemic, we could go to the California Department of Public um, Health and the San Bernardino County Department of Public Health um, for guidance regarding education. Today, you have to um, filter through a January 14th guidance um, that takes you to a, a website that's called the CCEE. These are not excuses. These are just the web that Mr. Schlosser was indicating exists for educators at this time. Um, the questions regarding the tiers of education and when we can reopen are all dependent on whatever the decision is at the state level on any given day. Um, two weeks ago, we heard that it was a window of um, 14 consecutive days, and the next statement was each Wednesday, you will know whether or not you've moved into a tier. There is no longer consecutive days. It's an announcement, and on Wednesday, you get to make a decision as to whether you can move. We continue to um, follow multiple <laughs> guidances from capital advisors, CASBO, CSBA, AXA, CTA, every group that we can follow to get information so that we can try to um, do the best by our students and have answers that are appropriate for our community. Um, I understand that others have been able to reopen, um, but that is not um, San Bernardino County. Um, as, as you recall, we are the only large school district that reopened um, under a waiver. There are some small ones that have remained open, um, and there is a charter that has remained open. Um, the population we serve will continue to require some virtual learning. Regardless of 2021, 2022, we know there are families that are going to ask for that. That may transform what our independent study program looks like to some extent, um, which has been an in-person once a week type program, um, but we will take what parent need and student need is into account as we transition back to a normal educational setting. Um, and that said, we have worked diligently with our partner at St. Mary's, and I think we need to celebrate the fact that um, we have provided vaccinations to every educator in Apple Valley Unified School District, as well as our surrounding districts, um, who wanted one. Um, not just their first vaccination, but in many cases, the second vaccination. That will help us to navigate around the barriers that have been put up regarding this pandemic. Um, with that, 
we are super excited about next week. We don't plan to close again. Um, in fact, we just plan to continue to add to our in-person instruction and those that want to attend. Thank you. Board comments, Ms. Blasingham. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, I attended the uh, Apple Valley recital and I, my hats are off to that music department because you know, with all, no children going to school, that was the most yeah. phenomenal presentation they gave. I also take my hats off to the Granite Hills uh, teachers who put on that program as well, as my family enjoyed both of the sessions mm -hmm. as we watched it. Um, I'd like to uh, also thank our superintendent for her efforts with ensuring that our staff um, was getting vaccinated and to a special thanks to all of the AV staff that spent the time to volunteer their efforts to make sure our children get to go to school pretty soon. Um, and especially my hats off to um, Mrs. Nelson for coordinating all of that effort because it was a great effort um, to ensure that anyone who wanted the vaccine got it. And our kids are going to go back to school for that. So thank you very much. Mr. So. I'll keep my short. Okay, I think what our superintendent just stated uh, in response after the reading of all the public comments, my thinking is that maybe that those can be put in the form of a public uh, uh, letter to, to to the entire community. You know, we try our best. I mean, you know, when we but we have to follow the law, and there's nothing we can do about it. Okay, so that's my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bender. I want to concur on the role that our superintendent played. He took it full by the horn. Mm -hmm. We didn't throw any vaccines away. Um, we got most of the teachers vaccinated. Anybody else that straggled in, it was really, uh, and that wasn't just her, it was the staff, members of the, of the faculty and everything like that. But uh, that will help open the door to our schools. We gotta get the schools open, we all know that. We've right. all raised kids in this valley. It's imperative that we get the schools back open. But the mental health that these kids are going through right now is terrible. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Mr. Raleigh. Yes, I'd like to echo again. I. Uh, what uh, the other board members have said, uh, starting you know with this uh, vaccination, I had the pleasure of being up there a couple of times, uh, just uh, dropping somebody off and observing. And um, you know, I want to start with uh, obviously Trené got the ball rolling. I was told that by many people, and I like to thank the Catholic Diocese as well. They had a perfect place for this with at that church with the roads in and out of there, the big parking lot and the huge building. It was like the spot to go in the high desert. And uh, I, I saw when I was there, Kylie, I want to thank Kylie. She was out there at the podium checking people in and uh, these three gentlemen sitting here. I also saw them and I want to kind of make a call out uh, Jeremiah Harrison, who's the principal at Sitting Bull. Uh, I, I was, uh, the time I was there, they were running a little bit behind because they had run out of um, um, vaccines. So it was, you know, a little bit of a delay. And there was a, quite a bit of elderly people that had pulled up in their cars. And man, that guy did a really good job of uh, keeping things light and, and, and joking with the people in the cars and running up and down the, the, the parking lot there saying, you know, you're next, a couple more minutes. And, and uh, I, was, I was impressed. And uh, I don't impress very easily, but I was impressed <laughs> with this uh, group of people that were working there. And my hat's off, uh, really. Trina, you did a good job. And um, just like Dennis said, you know, we've all raised kids in this valley. Right. And when I was there, I was talking to a police officer that was there. There was just officers from Asperia and Apple Valley, and they were telling me that um, the calls of kids that are hurting and that are threatening suicide has gone you know, like one a day in, up in the high desert. And that's all because you know, schools are a safe zone for some kids, especially low-income kids. Um, there, it's it, it, it's safe. There's food. There's shelter, and they feel secure there. And without the schools being open, these kids are having a, a, a trouble. And I I surely wish 
that the state government and the federal government re realize the damage that is occurring to these children because these schools are closed. And I know as a district board member, all of our five of us sitting here, I'm sorry, um, all of us sitting here want the schools open ASAP and as long as with the, the staff as well. So um, that's right. Yeah, this, to keep up the good work. Thank you. And I want to thank the public for their comments too. Uh, it's, it's very frustrating for some of these people. So well, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, I have to say, though, um, I have uh, been listening to the comments from uh, my fellow board members and uh, the comments from members of the community. Um, <clears throat> Trinet was uh, actually a maestro when it came to getting this COVID vaccine uh, going. Uh, at some point, um, people thought she was an employee of St. Mary's Hospital uh, <laughs> because of how much she coordinated it. Uh, but also the comment that I got from the community was that um, there were these three gentlemen that were always around and they didn't know who they were. And I said, well, they were community members, but above all, they were assistant superintendents. So they did not wear their badge uh, while they were out there. They were just members of the community helping the community. Uh, and I, I came out really thrilled uh, to know that I am part of a community that is willing to help and not just the children, but their families, their grandparents. Ms. Nelson actually uh, called a few people that I sent her names to on a Saturday. So she came into work so that she can call those people and schedule them. And so she made some uh, interesting friends um, <laughs> uh, from those people that are my 80, 80, 80 plus years old friends. Um, but I also wanted to take this time uh, to acknowledge uh, all the parents who spoke today. Um, your, your comments have not been um, uh, ignored. Um, we are hoping that Mrs. Nelson will reach out to the different schools that, have, uh, that you all mentioned your children went to and, and verify or talk to the people who have, um, you, you believe were left be, that left your children behind. Um, our job in the district is to do what is best for your children. When we come into work, or when I come into work for the district, it is strictly on behalf of the families and the children and the employees. Uh, so we are going to do our best to do it right. Um, I don't want to lose one single child, but we are going to do it right. I will be more than glad to reach out to any one of you uh, if uh, that will help under, you have a better understanding of what we are doing. But I'm, I believe Mrs. Nelson uh, will handle your situation uh, as you have uh, stated at this board meeting. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, discussion action session. It is recommended that the Board of Trustees discuss and take action on the following items. Mutually agree on no more than six candidates for the 2021 California School Boards Association Delegate Assembly for Subregion 16B. If, if I may jump in, uh, these are people, they're the, the delegate assembly members have divided into two groups, the odd year, even year. Like for some next year, I'll be up on an even year. And the one with the asterisks are the, are the current uh, standing members. Uh, and I recommend the board support those on the asterisks. I'll uh, second uh, Wilson So's recommendation. Okay. Any opposed? Or have you, I, I think you all need to have a voice at least so that we don't just plan. I'm not so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So the, the six that we are going to take will be Tom Courtney, Lucerne Valley. Gabe Stein, Sherry McGall, uh, Eric Swanson, Mondi Taylor, and uh, Kathy Thompson. So one, two, three, four, five, six. That gives us our six. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Thank you. I approve the recommendation of the administrative hearing chairperson on the following discipline matters, effective immediately, annual review, AR 32. I think that's your job. So I'm reading your job. It's okay, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> annual <laughs> review, <laughs> AR 32, 2021, okay. and AR 33, 2021, be readmitted to Apple Valley Unified School, dis school District Students have met their terms and conditions of their re rehabilitation plans. Annual review AR 32 2021. Mm -hmm. I need a motion. I move. Second. All, yeah. All in favor? Aye. Annual review AR 33 2021. So moved. I need a motion. So moved. Second. Any opposed? Approve the certificated and classified personnel actions as listed. I need a motion. So Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. You want to take your job, sir? <laughs> you did good. <laughs> it is recommended that the Board of Trustees consider approving a number of agenda items as a consent list. I move, uh, we move, uh, approve items 1 through 31 on consent. I'll second it. I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> it's unanimous. <laughs> no. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, President Bukpara, um, we had a motion by Rick Raleigh and a second by Wilson So for that consent agenda. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure because we had several <laughs> seconds. <laughs> no, it just it was all over the place. Um, we don't have any staff reports. Um, Kali, do we have any additional um, comments? We do not. Yeah. Thank you. Superintendent, do you have any more comments? Just a quick um, appreciation to everybody that participated in the um, shot clinic. Um, we will recognize them publicly, but this was a village that it took to do this. And our goal had to get the 65 and over vaccinated in our community before the tier opened up. The county was surprised that there are no more educators um, that they needed to allocate vaccines for earlier this week. So we are proud of that as a community, and we will continue to celebrate that. Um, and I also want to um, acknowledge that we have lost several family members from Apple Valley Unified School District, yeah. both past and present, um, more present than I think I can in my history of being in this district can remember in a short period of time. And so taking the time this, this afternoon, this evening, um, to mourn with their families and to have a moment of silence um, to recognize that a, a piece of our Apple Valley family's mm -hmm. heart is gone. Thank you. Mrs. Basinger. Yes, I just want to say um, to all of the parents that um, wrote their letters and spoke tonight that we hear you. We've been working on it. And your kids are going back to school, little at a time, and so that everyone's safe. So just realize that we have been working. Mrs. So? I don't have any further comment. You, know, uh, you mentioned that I lost a quite a few co close friends here in the community, too. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things, it, this is a terrible t pandemic, and uh, well, we just need to stick together and work hard and, uh, and win this war. Thank you. Mr. Bender. Uh, I have no more. Mr. Raleigh. Uh, nothing further. And I have nothing further. Um, signing of documents. Yeah, we all have a sign. Seeing that there is no further um, board action. Uh, I move that we um, adjourn and sign the documents. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Thank you. We need a second. She, uh, Ms. O'Connor okay. made the motion. Um, Mrs. Klassen being seconded. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I need him to shut us up.